So welcome to another study read along video. Now a new study has come out about does enclosure size influence the behavior and welfare of captive snakes. Now it's funny because last time it was a very similar situation to the last study we read with the Python Regis. But this study is saying yes but habitat complexity and size is different. So why don't we focus on size? So this is going to be very interesting to see whether it's actually a complex environment that maybe they're seeking or actual they are seeking a larger environment so this is, I intend this to be a longer form video so pop this on in the background while you're pottering around caring for your reptiles or something or not just sit down but I've got my cup of tea and I've got my drink here ready so let's get into this study so, does enclosure size influence the behaviour and welfare of captive snakes, Pantherophis cutatus? So it's a corn snake study. Now, this is a journal pre-proof, so this isn't yet published. So again, like last time, we have a study uh, before it's published. Let's start with the abstract. I apologise for the journal pre-proof uh, watermark over the front, but there's not much I can do about that. So, Right. Abstract, there is much evidence in mammals and birds demonstrating the importance of providing sufficient space to allow captive animals to exhibit natural behaviours. However, little evidence exists for reptiles. The aim of this study was to ascertain whether enclosure size impacted on the behaviour and welfare of captive corn snakes, Pantherithus cutatus. Snakes, uh, sample size 12, were housed in enclosures that were either two-thirds the length of the snake, which is the small size, or longer than the length of the snake, which is the large size. So the control in this study is the two-thirds of the length sizes. Uh, their welfare was assessed through observations of animals in the enclosure and behavioural tests. After completing these tests, each animal switched to the other housing condition, or the counterbalance across individuals, and received the same welfare assessment. So they're swapping it around to see how it affects going from one to the other. Now there is a study out um, that said, was a couple of years back, I'll have to find it, but it said that welfare is damaged more from an animal having something and you taking it away than them never experiencing it in the first place. You don't know what you haven't got sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see how the snakes react once they've been given this large enclosure and then made to go to a smaller enclosure and having like space taken away from them. Following the second set of behavioural tests, all animals received a preference test. When housed in large enclosures, snakes were found to be more active and spent time stretched out, a behaviour that was not possible in the small enclosure. The behavioural tests revealed few effects of space revision. Provision, sorry. However, when given a choice, snakes showed clear preferences for the large enclosure whilst active. Although this preference was not observed whilst resting, these findings suggest that providing a large enclosure is beneficial to the behaviour and welfare of captive snakes. Not providing sufficient space to allow snakes to fully elongate appears to thwart a behavioural need and thus impacts negatively on their welfare. We therefore recommend that captive snakes be kept in an enclosure longer than their body length. Now what they're doing is they're using corn snakes because they're cheap and easy to get hold of as a proxy for captive snakes. So certainly once we've read this, this could be very true for corn snakes. And I think a lot of Rackham and Stackham corn snake keepers are in for a shock with this, although although they haven't taken notice of any of the UV studies and corns and stuff anyway, so I don't think it really matters to them. Right, introduction. Reptiles are popular pets, with an estimated 1.2 million being kept in the UK, substantially greater than the numbers of more traditional pets such as hamsters, 600,000, and guinea pigs, 800,000. Despite this popularity, there is much debate regarding appropriate housing and husbandry for reptiles in captivity. With vets attributing many health problems to improper care, this appears to be due to a lack of knowledge rather than a lack of attachment to pet reptiles. That's true. There's so many like beardy mums. Why am I saying mom? I'm not American. Beardy mums and all that stuff. 
where they like obviously adore their reptile, but they don't know how to care for it properly. So one particular challenge is the limited information available on the specialist requirements of species that are commonly owned, reflecting a general shortage of underpinning scientific research, both in captive and wild populations. There is also conflicting evidence on the uptake of this information, with some research finding that uptake of information can be poor. I would agree with that, it's really hard to get people to actually look at decent information. Whilst others have found that husbandry practices change and improve with the availability of information, also true, it's not everyone that's blind to research and new information. Highlighting the importance of sound scientific evidence base evidence-based husbandry, essentially. One aspect of particular debate is the issue surrounding enclosure size and the available space necessary for snakes. They are unusual in both their length relative to their overall size and in the way in which they utilise their environment. Snakes are kept in varying conditions, ranging from a rack-style system, where they are kept in relatively small boxes, to large vivaria that are of greater length than the snake itself with no consensus on what is most suitable for good welfare. For example, in the licensing of activities involving animals, Regulations 2018 Guidance Notes for Conditions for Selling Animals as Pets, well that's a mouthful, the minimum enclosure length for snakes is two-thirds the length of the snake, i.e. less than the length of the snake, with many keepers housing their snakes in enclosures of this size or less However, it is recommended that snakes are given sufficient space within their cage to allow them to stretch to their full length and the potential to move lengthways. Given that many commonly kept snake species can grow to, I'm just going to move down here, significant lengths, e.g. corn snakes grow to around 150 centimeters and sometimes larger. Maximum recorded individual was 182 centimeters. This recommendation requires substantial enclosure sizes that are often considerably larger than many owners may provide. Restricted movement due to confinement is considered to be a primary stressor for animals in captivity because it potentially results in the inability to escape from aversive stimuli such as light, sound, and inappropriate climatic variables as well as con and heterospecifics. For animals more commonly kept as pets, such as rabbits, the importance of sufficient space to carry out normal behaviours, including a wide variety of locomotory behaviour, e.g. rearing and stretching, and spatial use, e.g. exploration, has been identified, and cages that inhibit this behaviour have a negative impact on welfare. Similar findings have been demonstrated for a range of behaviours, including chickens, rats, and primates. It is thought that insufficient space can lead to a number of health problems for reptiles, e.g. loss of bone density and muscle, and weight gain leading to obesity. Now in the wild, although snakes spend time resting in a cold position to protect themselves from predators and to retain heat, they may reach near to their full length whilst active. Snakes have distinct locomotor patterns that are utilised to move effectively around their environment. For example, they move in a rectilinear motion, i.g. a caterpillar-like movement where the body is maintained in a straight line, and use constantina locomotion in arboreal habitats. All types of locomotion use some degree of body straightening. With this particularly common rectilinear, constantina and sliding motion, these types of locomotion are key behaviours within the natural behaviour repertoire of a snake and so providing an enclosure that thwarts the expression of these behaviours may compromise their welfare. So far I have no objections to any of this, it's this is essentially common sense really. Uh, snakes, need, snakes need for space provision has caused considerable debate. Yeah, you're telling me. Um, the single study to date that has looked at the effect of enclosure size alone on snake behaviour investigated the impact of rearing rattlesnakes in two different sized enclosures. No effect of enclosure size was observed on either their response to a novel environment or their persistence in following the scent of a prey item. However, this study was confounded by age and crucially with adult rattlesnakes of a species reaching a length of 89 centimetres. Even the large enclosures used in the study were substantially smaller than the length of an adult rattlesnake. As such, once fully grown, snakes would have been able to stretch out in both conditions. 
Two recent studies have found that increasing environmental complexity and enclosure size together resulted in increased behavioural diversity and activity levels in two species of snake, the giant hognose and python regis. They're citing that the python regis study we read in the last read-along video. However, in these studies, both enrichment and enclosure size were changed at the same time, making it difficult to determine what specific aspect influenced the snake's behaviour, particularly given that the provision of enrichment alone impacts behavioural diversity and activity levels in snakes. The aim of our study was therefore to fill this knowledge gap by comparing the impacts of two different enclosure sizes on the range of behaviour exhibited by and the overall welfare of one of the most commonly kept captive snake species, the corn snake, where the larger enclosure was longer than the maximum length of corn snakes. So now we're moving on to the methods, and this is really interesting. As my uh, channel gets larger, I would like to start doing studies. When you have a room which you can dedicate to just setting up environments to do studies, then I think we're going to start having some really cool videos on this channel. But for now, we're just trying to grow this channel out and hopefully in the future we can make positive impacts but anyway methods 12 captive bred adult corn snakes measuring 118 to 157 centimeters from a range of backgrounds and experiences were obtained from a reptile shelter these snakes were housed at the university of lincoln for the duration of the study and returned to reptile shelters for rehoming at the end of the study. Snakes were fed every two weeks on a Friday afternoon at 3pm. They were fed one dead frozen thawed mouse, appropriate to their size. If the snakes refused to eat, another feeding attempt was made the following day. If at this point the food was still refused, further attempts were not made until the next Friday. Snakes were handled regularly for brief periods, 2-5 to five minutes each day to habituate them to the handling they would experience when moved to the arena for testing. As well as that required for general husbandry purposes, snakes were not handled for two days after feeding or during shed once their eyes turned milky until 24 hours after completing their shed. Snakes were housed in one of two sizes of enclosure, a small enclosure measuring 83 by 35 by 39 centimeters. So it was a tiny enclosure, approximately equal to two thirds of the snake's length according to guidance, or a large enclosure measuring 179 by 58 by 58 centimetres, uh, longer than the greatest length of any snake. Snakes were assigned to either a small or large enclosure on their arrival. This was balanced for approximate size. All animals were housed individually. Six of the snakes were thus housed in the small enclosures, and the remaining six in the large enclosure. The room lighting was on a 12 hour light dark cycle. Lights came on at 7 and turned off at 7. All enclosures contained a natural heat source controlled by a habistat dimming thermostat that was also on a 12 hour light cycle and a natural light source which was on for. What? All enclosures contained a natural heat source. What is a natural heat source? Are they referring to a, a heat lamp? Are they referring to a ceramic? Uh, and a natural light source? Is that LED? What, which was on four hours a day. The natural light source took the form of a 60 centimeter UV tube located in the middle of the ceiling towards the back of the enclosure for both the large and small enclosure. Both the heat lamp, okay, so now they've stipulated that it's a heat lamp, but they didn't do that originally. Both the heat lamp and the UV lamp were covered with a cage guard to prevent the snakes from coming into contact with the bulbs. All enclosures also contained the same enrichment in the form of a rock cave, a hanging hide, a humid hiding place containing moistened moss and compost, a branch, a water bath and a natural substrate. All items were consistent in absolute size between the two sizes of enclosure. So essentially, everything's the same apart from the size of the setup. Snakes were housed in their respective enclosures for a minimum of 32 days before experiencing 
a series of behavioural tests of anxiety, after which they were housed in the size of enclosure that they had not previously experienced, i.e. from small to large or large to small, which they then also experienced for a minimum of 32 days, before being presented with the same set of behavioural tests. Oh, sh- shut up, Siri, I don't care. <laughs> Bear with. <laughs> right, the welfare assessment. A series of enclosures were used to assess whether there was a different impact on snake welfare between the two enclosure sizes. A combination of techniques were used within enclosure observation to measure behaviours expressed and space utilisation, behavioural tests to measure a response to a mild stressor, and preference tests after exposure to both enclosure types. The snakes were also weighed throughout the study. This approach allowed a comparison of how the animals behaved in and interacted with the enclosure, the impact of housing on their health and anxiety levels, and their preference for the different enclosure sizes. Behavioural observations were performed twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. Snakes were video recorded in the enclosure without the observer present in the room to ensure the behaviour was not affected by human presence. Snakes were filmed for 30 minutes. After a snake was filmed, the observer recorded the location of the snake within the enclosure so that this could be recorded if the snake was not visible in the video, e.g. in a shelter slash hide. Filming was carried out at different times of the day, spread over the full 12 hour period that the lights were on, to take in any account any effect on behaviour of that time of day. The order in which the snakes were recorded was pseudo-randomised to control for effects of observation order. Snakes were not handled for two hours prior to recording to avoid any effects of handling. Snakes were housed every Friday before feeding if on a feeding day. Uh, Sorry, snakes were weighed every Friday before feeding if it was on a feeding day. Apart from when they were in shed, snakes were weighed to the nearest 5G. To overcome differences as a result of snakes not being present in the data set for that day, i.e. when shedding, an average was calculated using values either side of the missing value. If multiple values were missing, a moving average was calculated. I wonder why they uh, weighed to the nearest 5G. I mean, when I weigh my snakes, I just do it in exact grams. Anxiety tests. The snakes were given behavioural tests of anxiety to observe their response to novelty. Novelty tests are a classic test for anxiety-like behaviour and have been demonstrated to be appropriate for reptiles. These were carried out on two occasions, once each time after the animals had experienced one of the two housing conditions for 30 days. On both occasions, the snakes were given a novel environment test followed by a novel object test. Two arenas were set up so that two snakes could be tested at a time, one in each arena. The snakes were returned to their home environments between trials and were given an intra-trial interval of 15 to 35 minutes. Uh, The arenas were cleaned with diluted disinfectant prior to and in between every trial. The temperature of each snake was measured using an infrared thermometer on the dorsal side at approximately the midpoint between the head and the tail before the start of each trial. Experimenters moved to the adjoining room for the duration of the trial and observed the trial on a monitor. Each trial lasted for 10 minutes from the point at which the experimenter left the room. Trials were video recorded for later analysis using a video camera, suspended above the centre of the arena. Behaviours analysed are in table S3. Okay, the novel enrichment test The snakes were assigned to one of two arenas. Both arenas measured 86 by 86 by 75 centimetres. The arenas were designed to contrast in texture, colour, pattern and reflectiveness to enhance novelty. For the second test, after they experienced the second size of enclosure, the snakes were exposed to an arena they had not yet experienced. Assignment of which arena was experienced first was evenly balanced across the size of enclosure, i.e. half of the snakes that were housed in a large enclosure first experienced arena A first and the other half arena B first. The arena was covered with an acrylic lid. The snakes were placed in the same locomotion 
uh, the snakes were placed in the same location at the start of each trial. The preference test. This is the one that I am most interested in. Um, after the second set of behavioural tests have been completed, snakes were given a preference test between the large and small enclosures. Each snake, therefore, received just one preference test after it had been experiencing uh, one size of enclosure. Uh, both sizes of enclosure, sorry. Test setup was created by cutting a hole in the back of one small and large enclosure and joining them together with a plastic T tube. T junction to create a straight tube and a screw cap for the access point. The top of the enclosure was removed and replaced by a 4mm sheet of acrylic to allow viewing from above. The original vivarium glass was covered with an opaque sticky back plastic to create a visual barrier between the snake being tested and the other snakes in their home enclosures. So with the T junction, obviously you've got your access point, it goes in, they can either go left or right into a small enclosure or the big enclosure. The snakes were placed in the T-tube for and replaced the following day at 10. A camera was placed directly above the setup. The camera recorded a time lapse at two second intervals from, from 4 to 10. An infrared light was placed above the setup to allow viewing in the period in which the room lights and heat lamps were off. As the snakes were recorded over an 18 hour period under both light and dark conditions, during which their activity levels varied, we assessed their preferences both when active and when resting. So we have a figure here of the setup. We, <laughs> we have the most squashed figure I've ever seen. <laughs> but we can make out what's going on here. So everything is near enough the same. The only thing that stands out to me here straight away is they've got their heat lamp right on the end, but then their UV light miles away from the heat, which means you aren't getting an overlap of wavelengths, making it really weird. I would have placed that closer to the bowl, but yeah. I'm just thinking, would that impact anything? Especially with, with things like colubrids, typically they like to just stretch out along the length of UV to take in them rays. But I don't know if that would necessarily matter to test this when the UV lights and the cage were exactly the same length. I think you might see them just stretch out the length of the UV possibly. So yeah, I don't know. That's not how I would house them husbandry wise okay let's go to results uh, behavioral observations snakes were significantly more active when housed in the large enclosures i.e less time spent resting whilst resting snakes in the large enclosures spent significantly more time loosely coiled and snakes in the small enclosure spent significantly more time partially coiled and tightly coiled snakes also spent on average approximately 19 percent of the time stretched while resting in the large enclosure. However, this was not compare however, this was not compared to st I hate this bloody word, I can't say it. Statistically, because snakes in the small enclosure were not able to exhibit this behaviour. Snakes spent significantly more time visible when in the small enclosures. Now again, if we think back to the tight spaces video I made, where we looked at that corn study where it showed that complex cover and complexity in the environment and different the more hiding areas you provide, the more out and open the corn snake was. I'm wondering if because the small enclosure was more tightly compact and I want to say secure, um, perhaps that's why they were more visible in that enclosure. There were no significant differences between any of the other observed behaviours. Snakes in the large enclosures spent significantly more time in hides, particularly the hanging hide, whereas in the small enclosure snakes spent more time on the substrate and on the branch. Okay, weight. Weight did not significantly differ between enclosure sizes throughout the study or between enclosure sizes over time. Snakes had a similar range of body temperatures during the novel experiment test. No significant differences were found in the novel environment test between snakes in small or large enclosures. Snakes had to use the connecting tunnel in order to visit both enclosures. Therefore, 
To ensure that the snakes were able to demonstrate a preference, they had to visit both the large and small enclosures at least once during the preference test. If this did not recur, they were retested, and only results from tests where both enclosures were visited are included. See, I'm happy about this because originally I thought, well, what if a snake, you put it into the tube and it goes one way, and it just stays in that enclosure because that's the original one it went to. But I'm good that they've put this in place that it's not just chance that the snake chose that setup, you know. 10 out of 12 snakes completed on their first test. The remaining two on the second test. Analysis of the preference test data revealed that when they were active, the snakes spent a significantly greater proportion of the time in the large enclosure. When they were resting, they did not display a significant preference for either enclosure size. Right, now we're moving on to the discussion. So this is the the author's interpretations of the results. I'm interested in seeing how much of a leap they take with what they think their results mean in this. And I'm interested to see whether I agree or disagree with this. Our findings suggest that housing captive corn snakes in large enclosures longer than the length of the snake was beneficial to their welfare. I agree. As a positive welfare indicator, a animal should be allowed to express a behaviour or engage in, a, in an activity they are appearing to be motivated to perform. So that was a mouthful. But basically, if a snake wants to do something, they should be allowed to do it. When housed in large enclosures, snakes were more active and spent time stretched out. In addition, when given the choice between the two sizes of enclosure, snakes exhibited a strong preference for the large enclosure when active. However, the results of the behavioural test were less clear, with no consistent indication of differences between the two enclosure sizes in the recorded anxiety measures. When snakes were housed in the large enclosure, we observed greater activity, stretching and exploration. The expression of normal behaviour considered to be welfare enriching. Enhancing. Expression of normal behaviour considered to be welfare enhancing. Snakes in the large enclosure also spent significantly more time in the hides, whereas snakes in small enclosures spent more time on the substrate, resulting in more time spent visible. Eastern blue tongue lizards, blue tongue skinks, your weirdos, say skink, were also found to make more use of hides in larger enclosures. This highlights the importance of providing suitable hiding places and environmental complexity alongside additional space. That's the one thing I was going to say about that. The fact that they're spending more time in hides in a larger enclosure. Yes, they might want to stretch out and stuff, but we have to remember that a larger enclosure also has to be environmentally complex, but they've said that themselves. So, Improving the quality as well as the quantity of space. I agree with that. I would rather see a snake in a quality complex environment than a barren empty setup that's just maybe longer. Because corn snakes require a suitable selection of hides and other resources to meet their behavioural and cognitive needs. Whilst resting, snakes spent significantly more time tightly or partially coiled when housed in the small enclosures, whereas snakes in the large enclosures were observed to spend significantly more time loosely coiled, reflecting the greater space availability, but also more positive welfare state of reduced anxiety and increased relaxation. When housed in large enclosures that allowed them to stretch out, the snakes chose to do so, spending around 19% of their time resting in that position, an option that was not physically available to them when housed in the small enclosures that were two-thirds of the length of the snake's body length. Housing a snake in a small enclosure would therefore thwart these strongly motivated natural behaviours, representing significant welfare concern. Yeah. I tell you what, racks are going to drag this hobby down with them. The results of the behaviour tests were less clear, with few indications of differences between the two enclosure sizes and the behavioural tests of anxiety or conflict. The small number of significant differences that were observed in these four tests, e.g. snakes in small enclosures spent more time with their body in contact with a novel object, and snakes in large enclosures spent more time outside of the hide in, a re in the reverse emergence test, were apparently contradictory. 
with so few significant results in the range of behavioural tests used here, and no significant effects at all for the novel environment test or emergence test, these results should be taken with caution. Marmi et al. similarly found no effect of enclosure size on the response of rattlesnakes to novel environment. Therefore, it may be that, although these kinds of tests have been found to be effective in tortoises and bearded dragons, they are less appropriate for snakes, either because individual differences potentially mask an effect, or because any effect that did not impact snakes in such a way that changed their behaviour under these conditions. Preference and choice tests. Preference and choice tests are thought to be an important measure of animal welfare and can be used as a benchmark against which other measures can be validated. The preference test results suggest that snakes strongly prefer to have access to a larger enclosure than their own body length when active. However, they exhibited no preference whilst resting when they used both enclosures equally. This lack of preference is likely to reflect the snake's natural behaviour in which they both rest in shelters and small spaces, and, when comfortable with the environment, rest elongated. In contrast, they strongly preferred additional space when active within the environment. That snakes expressed a preference when given the opportunity indicates that housing them in a small enclosure, where no such behaviour is possible, is likely to result in compromised welfare due to the lack of control of their environment and an inability to perform behavioural need. Providing animals with the choice between resting in a suitable hide or elongating whilst active or resting not only more closely imitates what is available in the natural environment but also mimics behaviours observed in the wild. Yeah, I mean, a larger enclosure means obviously more opportunities for natural behaviours to occur because you can make it more complex and also, thermoregulation can be more complex by having a greater degree of a gradient across it by being larger. Although there were clear welfare benefits to being housed in large enclosures, we observed no differences in body weight between the two housing conditions. And there were also too few examples of positive stress behaviours, e.g. nose rubbing gaping, in either enclosure size to allow analysis. However, the study was also conducted over a relatively short period in comparison to the potential lifespan of a captive snake, and so may not have reflected any cumulatively negative effects on welfare associated with long-term exposure, including weight gain. It should be noted that in our study, the snakes had identical enrichment in both enclosures, and though there were some differences in the amount that they were used in between conditions, all enrichment items were utilised in both environments something that is important for the welfare of captive reptiles. This enrichment provision might have mitigated the lack of space in the small enclosure to an extent, although without satisfying the important motivation for stretching out necessarily for good welfare. In addition to providing the necessary space in which to perform natural behaviour, larger enclosures allow greater scope for environmental enrichment and an increased within cage environmental complexity with the aim of encouraging the amount and diversity of positive behaviours, whilst reducing behaviours indicative of negative welfare. This is thought to increase an animal's resilience and ability to cope with challenges that it may face. Enrichment, e.g. branches and hides slash shelters, should be provided alongside the additional space to give the snakes options for concealment, basking, climbing, exploring, bathing and other important behaviours as well as to provide cognitive stimulation, which has been shown to improve snake welfare, and even performance on a cognitive task. However, it is important that the enclosure is sufficiently large for these resources to be present, while still providing sufficient space on the floor to move about freely and occupy a rectilinear position. In conclusion, oh, sorry. In conclusion, when the snakes had more space available, they chose to use it, both during phases of activity and to stretch out when resting, suggesting a clear and valued behavioural need that should be met to maximise their welfare. It is important to emphasise that good animal welfare requires these kinds of positive rewarding experiences and opportunities, and not just the absence of suffering. As such, based on the preferences of the snakes and within enclosure behavioural observations, it appears that the provision of additional space 
sufficiently large enough to stretch out to their full length, especially when snakes were active, was beneficial to the behaviour and welfare of captive corn snakes, and it is a requirement that cannot be satisfied in smaller enclosures. Our recommendation would therefore be that an enclosure longer than the snake's body length is provided for captive snakes, or at least the length of the snake. Um, Acknowledgement, this work was funded by the RSPCA and World Animal Protection. We thank the Cold Blood Care Working Group for highlighting this work of concern for their helpful discussion. We thank Zoran Tadek for useful input. Uh, this research study was approved by the University of Lincoln Ethics Committee. You can make an argument for bias here with the fact that World Animal Protection funded this, but for the most part, this study is done very, very well. Um, not only did they talk about the absence of negative welfare, but the importance of positive welfare indicators. You might, you, I know some people could make an argument that you could say, fine, corn snakes might be better in a larger enclosure, but that's not necessarily the same for my little king snake or something. Although anecdotally, I know that if I gave my kings a larger enclosure, they would use it. So you can argue all day long that it's too much of a leap to say for all captive snake species when that's a very, very diverse group of species with different behaviours and that occupy different niches. But at the same time, nearly all of these species, you could probably make an argument for um, <laughs> their niche is a lot larger than 2x1x1, two by one by one, so... <laughs> And even a lot larger than the 6 by 2 by 2 So, But the thing that worries me, as I'm, we're going a little bit sideways here, bear with me. The thing that worries me is that World Animal Protection, a anti-reptile keeping group that pushes for positive lists and banning of keeping if they could get their way, they're very organised and very clever and they know where to put their money into science not just blabbering articles and viral campaigns on the internet they're funding studies so that when the time comes when the hobby doesn't get its ass in gear they can go to government when they want to push legislation look we've got studies and science saying snakes need this 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 and this and these people not only aren't providing for their animals but they don't acknowledge the actual needs of their animals. Of course, certain subset, like me and you, we all want to care for animals. and Most of us have quite elaborate, complex enclosures. But for a lot of the hobby that still thinks that enrichment is make-believe and the only thing a snake needs is food and water and it's fine in, a, in like a rack, I think that it's difficult because I know that the hobby is reliant upon production using racks to meet demands. You can make that kind of argument, but I do feel like the way the hobby behaves and says, like, oh, racks are all they need, and they disregard science and welfare, it just feels like a lead weight tied around your ankles while you're trying to swim. The more and more the hobby disregards science and the actual deeds of our animals the more and more legislation is going to be pushed against us to force us to change it's all fine and good for all these hobbyists that want to say we don't need any legislation we can police ourselves and we can self-regulate but the moment you and i try and actually self-regulate and say no our animals need more space and this and that it's like don't say that don't say that no the status quo is fine don't say that. That's going to give animal rights activists propaganda. It, it's just like, no, they don't need propaganda. They have science. In a certain subset of this hobby are just failing, really. The only way the hobby continues is if husbandry continues, is if culture in the hobby continues and progresses to an evidence 
based approach. If we carry on with the ignorance and not recognising science and welfare and the natural history of these animals, then we deserve what we get, frankly. So, sorry about that little rant at the end there. Study's good. There was a few times where I found it difficult to read, where I think a comma could be placed here and there, because the flow of which I read it was really weird. I don't like seeing animal World Animal Protection funding it, but at the same time, I know if I wanted to do a study testing king snakes in a larger enclosure, and someone offered me money, I'd be like, well, I'll take your money, but I'm not necessarily changing my biases to... Leave a comment and a like. Let me know whether you actually like this series and you want me to continue reading some studies because there's a whole batch of lists of studies that I could read and I enjoy reading studies and discussing this with you. Um, I like the longer form, just relax and actually have a discussion video. So let me know what you think of that. And if you want to see the previous study on ball pythons in complex or tubs and racks, watch this video here.